be like, no one's gonna, no one's gonna try that, are they? No one's gonna game it like that. But now because of the- And then Nigel Farage yeah. said, hold my pants. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. A lot of the people who voted reform would have been Tory voters in the past. And a lot of people, the reason they've not voted for the Tories this time is because of how much the Tories fucked up Brexit. So instead they voted for Nigel Farage's party. Well, do we remember that he had a hand in that somewhat? <laughs> Obviously, see, see, this is this is the, the classic trope of fascism, is the stab in the back. And this is the idea that Brexit should have been... Brexit should have been a success, but it's not a success because the Tories weren't really committed to it. In fact, they wanted to fuck it up. So the Tories fucked up Brexit on purpose and you really need reform so the Brexit can be done properly. I just and want then, to know if you're listening to this and you voted yeah. reform that I fucking hate you and I actually think you're scum. That's I think that everybody should be entitled to their opinion. No, I think... freedom to vote. <laughs> think you, you know. I I, I may not uh, I may not agree with your your vote or how you use it, but I would I would die to defend your right to do it. However, have a fucking word for yourself for fuck's sake. I find um, I find the kind of insular, selfish, stupid nature of this just absolutely inconceivable. You know, they're like, well, these young men coming over here working age, right? So useful people who might come over here and work, you don't want them, right? Is there somebody you'd prefer? Useless people who can't work? Would that be better? Um, I, and I think this, I, I think the thing that depresses me most is the extent to which some people are incapable of imagining what it must have taken for somebody to uproot themselves. Imagine how bad things would have to be outside for you to make the decision that what you needed to do was put everything that you could carry into whatever bags you could manage to carry, walk out of your house, drive out of your house and get to the nearest border and cross it potentially on foot and potentially walk hundreds if not thousands of miles to to try and go somewhere anywhere else to make a start somewhere else. The complete lack of imagination because nothing in their life has ever been that bad. That they can't, that, 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 that somehow this is some shot, well, they want to come here. They want to come here for what? The weather? Fuck off. Yeah, you know? the fantastic economy. I just they 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 want to come here if they want to come here as opposed to somewhere else. Because actually, we've sold ourselves as this bastion of something or other, and the sole reason for your existence is apparently to prove them wrong. Yeah, I think the thing is that they always talk about oh, they're coming over here to take our jobs, or you know that that type of chat. I mean, people who do that all stopped working a long time I, ago. Generally, yeah, yeah. But I think that like there, there is like a really good conversation that should be actually be had about the fact that well, I mean, they're taking enormous risks to just get here to begin with. You know, life. You know, this death toll is, is insane of uh, people dying at sea. So there's a conversation to be had about well, well, like maybe let's create a world where they don't have to do that journey. Yeah. So it's not like get stay out of my country, but it's like well, what can we doing to improve the countries that these people are coming from? Yeah. But that's not the conversation. So what they seem to think is that these countries are just fucking terrible, and it's no one's responsibility to make them better or assist. Certainly not. But also to do they, can't, they can't come here either. So there, it's like you're just basically telling me you want these people to not exist anymore. Well, that you know, is what they want. Yeah, want to exactly. Not have to think about them. Yeah, uh, they try and say they're not the racist because... or fascist or Nazis, but when you sort of look at it through that lens, well, pick a lane, man. It, I, it, at least if you're saying don't come over here, let's help make the country that you're in better. Because I mean, th- there is an issue where if I mean, we have this in Scotland, we're about to have it because of the fucking living conditions of the economy here are so shit. The, the people with the skills are fucking leaving. So you always have that kind of retention problem. You want to keep your best and brightest where they are to start with so they can help build your economy back yeah. up. We also have a, a ground up problem in terms of actually training people in this country that starts in school. We are not closing the skills gap that we, we need for actual industry to the point where industry are actually having to go out to try to, to close these gaps themselves. We cannot sustain an economy in this country with the, the with natural poor citizens in Scotland Actually, globally, nobody can. Globally, immigration is a net positive for the economy. Mm-hmm. Always, always. There might at some point be a tipping point where it, it, it levels out and it goes the other way. 
we've yet to fucking find what that tipping point is, though, because it's, like the it's always so a net positive. Well, when you actually look at it, and considering like the drama that the media make out of this and the politicians make out of it, I mean, it is, it is I don't want to say the tourist drop in the ocean, but I mean, it's something like, it's one in every thousand. I mean, it's ludicrous numbers. So you know, the problem that you always get is that it will be things like you'll, you'll get an influx of people into an area and then in the short term, there is a lack of resources for you know, hospitals, dentists, doctors, that sort of thing. That's not the fault of the people who've arrived. That's the fault of the people who organise provision. Yes, poor organisation, poor infrastructure. It's also why we, we tend to, to create ghettos yeah, even if just temporary ones, but although not always just temporary ones, look at Govan Hill. <laughs> um, uh, but you're going to blame the the people who were corralled into these areas for the downfall of these areas when they were corralled with no economic opportunities, didn't speak the language. There was there was no no avenue for for them to be integrated into society. As you all talk about, how this is what you really want is for integration, and. Then when people do integrate into society and they're like second and third generation immigrants, you're still racist towards them because it's actually not, it's nothing to do with that. And exactly the same people would, without hesitation, have moved to Spain and lived there for 15 years without ever learning to say anything other than, you know, from a... They're not immigrants, they're think, expats. Think, yeah. It's a different thing. Totally different when you're white and I think the British. Spanish should have put that as like a, a fucking match win uh, stipulation in the Euro is where it should have been like, if we win this... You have her. got to fucking learn how to say something other than two beers, please. Yeah. The, the SNP needs to take away from this that it's not, that that we can't expect that people will vote for us. Um, the Labour Party for years and years and years just expected people to vote for them. Mm. And then when they stopped voting for them in droves, the Labour Party's response was basically to have a bit of a fucking tantrum about it. And behave as if their votes had been stolen. And they use that language like their voters had been stolen, like the SNP. You see George Fuchs sort of saying things like, oh, yeah, they're, well, they're doing this, that, and the other good things. And they're doing it on purpose. Like, we're, they're only doing nice things so that people will vote for them. Yes, that's sort of the point. That's how it works. So how about we do this thing and it'll be great for everybody? Oh, right, OK, yeah, I'll vote for that. Yeah, that's how that works, mate. Oh, it's like cheaters. Yeah, right, that's like they're, they're cheap. It, it, it reminded me of like um, a friend of mine telling me a, a, a story about um, getting uh, the 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 school bully basically told him he had to meet him after school and he was going to fucking punch his lights out, and he had no option for whatever reason because I think it was at like the school bus stop afterwards, and the school bully met him at the school bus stop uh, and went to punch him, and my mate ducked. And he punched the wall of the bus shelter and fucking hurt his hand and then cried and complained that it wasn't fair because my mate had moved his head. Yeah. Right? That was the Labour Party, really. It wasn't, that's not fair. So the SNP needs to not fucking do that. Yeah. In the short term, I'm of the opinion that the best fucking thing that we could do is just shut up. Yeah. Well, the, I was obviously I have not on Twitter now, so that's actually my follow-on uh, to this. So, just briefly though, that when uh, Corbyn was on his way up before crashing and burning in twenty nineteen, um, I, I was quite vocal in support, but in the context of I think it'd be quite good of England. Yeah, wait, this England, way, do you vote that? And then and we, we'll do, we'll this. do this. Yeah. Um, but I remember that uh, being on social media and even just suggesting that was met with quite a lot of negative feedback. It's sort of in the ballpark of what you're saying, the idea that rather than doing it as more of a healthy competition, tit for tat, learning, exercise, gradual improvement, there was quite a lot of people that were becoming quite entrenched. I, that's the question. It, what was the fallout on Twitter from the, the election result? Because I don't fucking know. So what, what was the kind of DS side? How did the SMP react on the night in the day? The, I, I think most SMP, um, ex-MPs and current MPs um, have have been quite humble. Yeah, they've been quite graceful in defeat. Except Joanna. Uh, except Joanna. Except Joanna, who just played Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, um, no, I think I think a lot of them expected it. 
I yeah. don't know if they expected it to to the extent that it happened, yeah. but I, I think that I don't think it could have come as a massive shock yeah. to to any individual. No, um, are you more? So we did talk about this before because this was before the election, the last episode. Um, would you say that when you were talking about that, you were not defensive is the wrong word, but because you were kind of in campaign mode, yeah. you were staying the course. But you would probably admit now that this was kind of yeah. not um, as bad as it was, but we'd do, expect I did do a lot of door canvassing, but I did do a little bit. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people that did an awful lot more of it than me, but I went out a few times knocking on doors, which is a horrible thing to do. I fucking hate doing that. I loathe it. Um, but a lot of people who, as far as I sort of, you know, records show I'd voted for us before were saying, I don't know or I'm not I've not decided. And I think when they were saying they'd not decided, they meant they were voting Labour or maybe they were not gonna a lot of people say, I don't know if I'm gonna vote. At most people that I every single one actually without fail that did that I know that voted for the SNP, family members included, all said I voted for them, but I did it reluctantly. That was very consistent feedback. That's what I felt. There was not an enthusiastic fuck yeah vote, which was a bit weird because when I was talking about it on the podcast, I was sort of saying, well, you know, this is, it's not Hollywood. This is different. This is, this is, you're, you're going down there to put the finger up to Keir Starmer and the Tories. This That's is... what you're there to do. But the way that the, the electorate were not enthused about that and as an it idea. Is, you know, it's, it, it's the, the, the scandals. I've not been helpful, quite frankly. Yeah. How much real scandal there is beyond simply the fact that the SNP were a little bit too um, too much of a small team. Um, that That's obviously been a problem. What will actually turn out to be the case with regards to the... the um, case against moral we'll only find out if and when it ever goes to fucking trial if it ever does so th- that's not helpful there's no two there's no two ways about it you a, a lot of people are not into the weeds on that um and the reporting of it was was frankly dreadful when you and and what about it what about it is bad however when you simply think about the amount of fucking scandal with the conservatives the amount of fuss that was made about this and the police time and money that's been spent seems to me to be disproportionate when Michelle Moan bought herself a fucking yacht with public money while people were dying. Um, but but nonetheless, that's not to say that if there's been wrongdoing, it shouldn't be punished. It should. Um, and we do need more sort of young blood coming through. Um, I still think John Swinney's a good choice for now. He's a yeah. steady hand. He's kind of like Scott so Wines, Joe Biden. The, the only yeah. negative. needs somebody yeah. else to come through. The only negative with Swinney is that he's still t- too close, in my opinion, to the orbit of the scandals that you're talking about. And I think that, yeah, having a. It just to have slow stepped away from Swinney, Sam, and Sturgeon triangle into a new group. You know, I'm not saying that we have to try we, it. We don't want a faction war here between, you know, a kind of new Labour, old Labour. We don't want that. But I think a kind of a Tom pass. I, I think that, it, it, as you say, it was attempted. But I think in some ways, actually, a lot of Hums to fall down was this idea of him being a continuity candidate with Nicola. It's like, but given what's happened, you, you need to break it on your own. And I don't think he had it in him. And I think that's he tapped out basically. I think it was just he didn't have. The... And also, to, like let's uh, let's give the guy a little bit of credit here. Yeah. In the face of looking like he was going to lose a vote of confidence, he he did what politicians are meant to do. He did yeah. kind of the honourable and decent yeah. thing. This isn't a defence of Kate Forbes because I think it's probably quite well established on this podcast. We think she's a bit weird. See, Kate Forbes is a Kamala Harris or a Theresa May. She's she's. Good in a lane, yeah. But you get her out of that but, lane, and she's just fucking weird. I, I, that's accurate. But I do, in some ways, admire the fact that at least she's having a go. Like it feels like she's like, I don't want to believe this party. I want to really try here, and it feels like that's what we're kind of lacking. There's a, there's a not I a clear. I really don't want to do. The one I, 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 I'm not saying that one, but what I'm saying is there seems to be a, a hums that I don't think stepped into that job like. Fuck yes, let's go. It was more a, oh Someone shit, Echo has gone. It. Someone's got to do it, you know. And I feel that that's what's not been happening over the last ten years is like that energy coming up. Fire in the belly. Fire in the belly to, to see that 
I want to not only have Nicola's job, I want to do that job better than her. And okay, as we've established, Kate Forbes' way of doing that is not what we would want. But I think there has been a lack of that kind of energy. Now, what I don't know the answer to is, is that energy there? And then there's a layer of the old guard in the SNP that has nullified it and said, nope, don't do that. Or is it just a lack of it? And there's kind of this great man complex and salmon or sturgeon. And therefore, it's more your Hamza type is just, I'm going to be second in command and I'm quite content with that. There's, there's an element of some of the better talent was at Westminster. Yeah. Um, and it'll be, there's some really good people that have lost their seats who might now be interested and put themselves forward for Hollywood. That might make a difference to, yeah. to the... I'm going to talk about sexy politicians. Mary Black is a sexy politician, in my opinion. She's, got to say she's often, uh, she's doing like a tour, isn't it? Like a stage show. Mm-hmm. It's like, Mary has a moan. I mean, that, that seems to be what it is, isn't it? It's just her, like, you know, you go along and she's just like, I... It, it's shite be working at Westminster. I was like, I could have probably told you that before you got yeah, the job done I mean, there, actually. It's fucking, it, it's fucking grim. This is why, when I, I, I do appreciate that the salary is pretty fucking decent. Okay. But what they have to put up with is fucking ridiculous. It's all right if you. Is this what if, she's doing now, though? Is she going to circle back into the game? At all? I don't know. Or she's, I don't know what she's doing now. I don't know. Just uh, making bank off this. I don't she's know. Getting the podcast game, Mary. Come on. Just every time I see her, I'm just like. You're so hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that was why she got she got too sexy for politics. She had to leave. Yeah, it's too too sexy there. socialism. You've crossed the threshold. Yeah, uh, you, you can't we can't be down here anymore. You, you're making the rest of us look too ugly. Um, <laughs> she's she's, I don't know what her plan in the long term is. I'm not sure she knows. I I think she if she I don't want to say go and get a real job, but I think that it. Because all she's done is this, I think getting a grounding in a sort of more normal world would be good. But I could definitely see 10 years down the pipe her coming back in again. But I think having something on the CV that wouldn't just be like, you you had to pull with that Westminster shit, occasionally make a speech. Like, I don't know how much gravitas that sort of has. I think going she is and, and has been a household name since she was very young mm-hmm. in Scotland, which I think does go a long way with it with an electorate. Like mm-hmm. yeah. if you were to see a, a bunch of other, you know, S and P members, people would be like, I've no idea who you're talking about. If you said Mary Black, they'd go, Oh yeah, I know who Mary Black is. Listen, I was in a fucking cab in Watford and the driver knew who he when when he found out it was a you know, standard standard chat with someone. Uh, about oh right, where you know where are you from kind of thing that was staying in a premier interview obviously not from there uh, and uh, he was <laughs> he was from Sri Lanka um, and he was uh, he was a Tamil and he'd heard uh, he's heard Mary Black speaking about uh, he'd heard her maiden speech and as somebody that was from a sort of independence movement within his own country. He was he was blown away by her, oh, and uh, he uh, and you just think she's uh, and she and he didn't have any difficulty understanding it. So Quentin fucking Let's can go fuck himself. <laughs> that whole pretending you can't understand the Scottish accent when you're English is just classism, yeah. and I can say this because I work with people on a daily basis who are based in China, who are based in Bangladesh, on a daily basis, and I'm talking to them over Zoom. Yeah. And I cannot tell you the last time somebody had to say, sorry, what, could you repeat that? They, under, they fucking understand me. I go down south to visit my sister who lives in Northamptonshire and I open my mouth to go, hi, sorry, could you tell me where the train station is? And they're like, what? What? And I'm like, this is just classism. It's they not that you can't not. understand they me, it's you don't understand. fucking want to. It's not, it's not yeah. just the Scottish accent. It's no, I know this. I mean, it's just like when I was in the RAF, thing. it was very common to have a kind of walking pub joke where it would just be like, you know, me, a Geordie guy, a liver puddly, and we're all sat at the same table, and just the guy from the south of England would just be like, I can't fucking understand any of you, you know? I mean, I, 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 don't know. So I understand that there are Scottish accents that are, are difficult to parse. Peter Head. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but. I I think that I've got quite but a that's basically Norwegian brand accent. Yeah, <laughs> I think I've got quite a brand I remember accent. Any, so there was an engineer actually that yeah he was from up north. So the closer you more you get into the highlands, it does get very bouncy. It's actually quite difficult to understand. 
and he wasn't allowed to use the radios because the pilots couldn't understand him. <laughs> but I heard him on the radio and I couldn't fucking understand him. So I didn't view that as racist or class. I, I was like, mate, we can't actually let you do this. Communication is not your strong suit. I remember yeah. a TV yeah. series called <clears throat> Troll a minute that they had to put, uh, it was all Peter Head guys, and they had to put subtitles on it because yeah. it was just like, Beep, 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 beep. Oh, yeah, I mean, the further north you go, the weirder people get and the harder they are to understand. I, I understand that. But, um, I mean, I went to Inverness uh, once and I was wearing a tartan skirt and the guy came over to be in the bar and went, right, what's your tartan? And I was like, it's Topshop. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. So I'm not that Scottish, mate. Yeah, I've drank in a few bars in Dundee and it's quite, like, their accent, even their... Sorry. It's fine, you can get it, but it's starting to verge on that bounciness that it's a wee bit more difficult to understand. I get a little bit fed up with the, oh, the SNP aren't inspiring sort of line of stuff, because I think we've had basically 10 years now of battling against a pretty unpleasant kind of... Unionist is not the right word, but establishment media. Yeah, it's. I think the the, the media have a lot to answer for in terms um, of how we've ended up in the boat that we're now in. Yeah, and you say, well, we're sort of, and we've now established for, via the court case and stuff that we're constitutionally moribund. Yeah. And you're complaining that we're not fucking dancing and singing while we're rubbing, rolling this boulder up a hill. Yeah, I, I yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if it is it is it about enthusiasm or I, I just think that we, we needs to be some kind of retool and I think we we do need um, a, a strong leader. Not that Swinney isn't but I think there needs to be someone comes in that really feels like a kind of fresh lick of paint has been put upon the whole thing and I think that's what we're, we're but where that comes from though is the question um, because I think there's a few people dotted around but, I mean, they would need work. I mean, we, we talked about off the podcast, we mentioned about, you know, the Greens last time. And it's like, I think Lorna Slater has all the tools there, but that's someone that needs to be sat under a Nicola Sturgeon for about five years plus to get the reps in to be able to do what Nicola yes. could do. Because I think that, I think her story, I think, is fantastic. You know, coming over from Canada, you know, she's a former engineer. She's clearly bucking gender stereotypes and trends left, right and centre. I think that speaks to life experience. But she's not a very good politician. But she's not a very good politician. But but she but I, by thinking on this is sometimes I think that the politician bit I think can be learned. The life experience is the bit that can't. You can't. Yeah. So it's like the Mary Black thing when I was saying this about the missing part is that okay you've got this experience of Westminster which is good, however, it, it's not a normal job. So that it, whether or not that would have prepared you to lead a nation question mark we don't know so i think whatever she chooses to do next if she wants to circle back into politics that's sort of the missing part so i i would much rather live in a world where people had all these great life experiences working in businesses different countries whatever and then they can learn to do politicians politics all yeah and you can make it podcasts around the podcast hi i think that yeah having people that have quite a lot of life experience that can then be taught how to do the politics, but I think it's a better way around than what we have absorbed quite a lot of, not just within the SNP, but Scottish politics in general. There's a lot of kind of, went straight out of school, was upset about the Iraq war, I went to Glasgow Uni, and I'm now leading a country. I mean, like Humza's CV is essentially that. It's, uh, I went to private school, went to Glasgow Uni, studied politics, presumably, and then became a parliamentary researcher, I think, and then sort of just fumbled his way through cabinet positions, and then suddenly he's in charge. I'm not sure that's how you create a leader. You know what I mean? I do. Yeah. I, and I think that that's maybe an area of talent recruitment, question mark. I don't know. I think these are things for the last 10 years where the SNP, frankly, could have almost slept walked into several election victories. Maybe they could have been headhunting within the public sector, potentially for people in prominent positions going, have you ever thought about giving politics a go? You think be quite good at this. It feels more that there was, I think particularly at Holyrood's end, a lot of people that... I don't know. I think they saw maybe an opportunity to get involved because they were enthused about Scottish independence. But whether or not they were the kind of people that would have been good to be put in charge of the Scottish Health Service or transport or whatever, you know, that that's, I think, maybe where things have gone a bit awry. I think there's a, a, real, a real problem in UK politics in general that I think is probably a, a 
relatively recent thing. There, there are no experts in yeah in senior positions anymore. Mm-hmm. This is why things like HS two can't get done because nobody actually knows what the fuck they're doing. So what you'll have like a fucking like a treasury secretary who what's your qualifications? You passed A level maths, okay? It's Good luck like, getting one the past A level maths. <laughs> well, and this is this is what I mean. There's a real there's a real dearth of actual expertise in people in the highest offices in the country who are overseeing these things. And also, as of, as of the last like ten years, I would say a real fucking reluctance and a, a sort of sneering condescension and derision about expertise. about experts and about expertise. Yeah. And about like you know, like I'm going, I think we've had enough well, I think we've heard enough from experts. I, cause I, th- yeah. I think that it's, it's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? Because you get people that aren't experts, are quite stupid, and then they get voted into these positions of power. And which then gives, they make a fuck of it. It gives them the illusion <laughs> of being an expert, of having that. It's like, well, I, don't, I didn't have to study any of this. I'm, I'm running the country now, so whatever. You know, and I think that... It's the Dunning-Kruger uh, effect, yeah. isn't it? Yet, yet again, that... Uh, what are your qualifications? Ten people signed this bit of paper to say I was real. <laughs> really? <laughs> are you real? Me. I think I, the question I always think is that when people are voting for the individual candidates they vote for, like, do they actually look at the candidate? Because I think what happens no, quite frequently yeah. is people, it's my team is better than your team. Yeah. See, so even when I vote agree, I did look up and say, like, okay, you're a former doctor and you've done work with refugee charity. That's quite good. Like, you know, that speaks to someone that's got a bit of life experience. It's not just like some random pleb that's gone to uni and made a go of politics or whatever. So, you know, I do tend to make the effort to vote yeah, according I think to. you're in the minority. But that's it. I don't, I don't think most people are doing that. And because the first past the post, you can't afford to do that. Think, you have to really vote entirely. The nationalist thing, I think the, the stalemate thing becomes a real problem because it, I think people have engaged with it exactly like that. As in, my team is the yellow team and I don't like the blue team. And as long as the team is the yellow team, that's all fine. But it's what we haven't done a good job of. And the unions are exactly the same. We're not necessarily vetting at any point who we're bringing on to the team it's just oh you're happy to be on this team fantastic you're on the team you know um, let's face it nobody talks about Scottish independence more than Douglas Ross mm, yeah okay exactly but, I mean, it, to the extent that you know the, the way the guys who go you know the, the way the American Republicans who go on about the gays all the time you just know what their fauna <laughs> history looks like right to think this is just like William Wallace uh, like cosplayers it's just like a picture of Mel Gibson, like and he's so dead. He makes his wife paint her face blue. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to imagine any more of this. <laughs> well, no. let's keep going. Let's keep going. You brought it up. <laughs> just no. because it's my fault doesn't mean I want to have to deal with the consequences of it. I should be a Labour MP. <laughs> um, I I think one of the things that's gonna it, that that is sad is going to be that there will be less representation of Scotland in Westminster now. We're not the third party anymore. Um, the Liberal Democrats are with Ed Davey. And um, I've never heard you say his name in any other tone of voice than Ed, Ed Davey. Davey. I mean... <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, what? I, I, I sat and watched him give evidence to the post office inquiry the other day. I had it running while I was at work, as I so often do. Because apparently I'm a masochist, um, and all I could think of as I listened to him was um, that Harry Enfield character of Tim Nice but Dim. Yeah, <laughs> right. He doesn't seem like he's a bad chap. Yeah, he is a chap. He's definitely a, a, a chap. I think a lot of Liberal Democrats. Oh. That's kind of how you would define them. It's these sort of like naive butters type characters that would go into a coalition with the Tories and just be like, well, let's uh, let's make the country a lot better. Hey, hey, you know, they're all really enthusiastic. And meanwhile, the Tories are like, we're going to kill all of you. And they're just like, oh, well, ah, it's all good by. There was all yeah. this stuff. And, and throughout the course of the um, him, him being questioned, there was all this stuff that had come in front of him. And he's like, oh, yes. I mean, with hindsight, I probably should have thought about that. And yes, I wish I'd done this. And yes. And it just completely uninquisitive now ironically because I don't fucking like her at all she drives me nuts but Jo Swinson was on and Jo Swinson I find really 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 irritating I mean she's just grating she's got one of those voices she's got a sort of jolly hockey sticks sort of Scottish Fraser Nelson that kind of like faux anglicised 
posh Scottish accent that makes me want to get a bit stabby. She's really, really irritating. But I'm going to give her, a, like, props here. She was fucking raging about it because she'd been in a ministerial role there and she had tried to ask questions and it was perfectly clear that she had tried to ask, ask questions. And they tried to roll stuff past her and her civil servant had basically been so humphreying her and fucking lying to her and this, that and the other. And she was calling it all out. She's not in power anymore, so she can say what the fuck she wants. But despite her being somebody that, generally speaking, I mean, I wouldn't vote for and I don't like her, I believed what she was saying, that she was actually really, really fucking irritated and affronted by what she now knows, because a lot of the stuff that she that's come out through the inquiry, she was reading everything and preparing for this, and she seemed much, much sharper, much sharper than Ed Davey. Um and there was a there was a little bit of back and forth in the questioning because the she basically accused Paul of Annals, um, who had been the CEO of uh, the post office. Um, she accused her of having known about elements of, of this that Paul of Annals has denied, and she she was she was quoted the fact that Paul of Annals had spoken about something very specific in an email that meant she must have known about some like a thing that's called the Clark advice. That, and uh, the Clark advice is to do... It, 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 basically, it's like mens rea. It's knowledge of guilt. And Paula Vennels put one of the first fucking times I've ever seen it, Paula Vennels' barrister had a go at Joe Swinson to basically try and undo this, to try and say, well, you don't know that. You don't know that she knew about this thing because... Um, you've got no evidence of that. And Joe Swinson was fucking like that. She had mentioned this in this email, therefore that refers to that. So she, so in my opinion, she must have known. Well, you don't have it. No, I don't have any other evidence other than that. But from my reading of it, and Joe Swinson was really vocal about it. So I want to give her props to the fact that she's read all this. She is much, much sharper. Ed Davey is... I mean, and Ed Davey, I think, is probably more reflective of the majority oh. of them. I, I think that's a, I think that the, it's a good use of the word like inquisitive and how, yeah, you wonder if that's the civil service maybe is a problem there too. Where undoubtedly, where it's like, yeah, they've kind of all been trained to just you just go and do the speechy stuff that you do. We will do all the actual work. Have you? you know? I, I mean, I always recommend that everybody should watch Yes Minister, yeah, Yes course. Prime Minister, because yeah. apart from anything else, it's, I mean, it's a fucking masterpiece of, of yeah. comedy. It's absolutely beautiful. It's also very depressing that all of it still stands up to the point where the Tories were in power. You could watch that, and it, this could just be a modern. This, this is just it. And the reason is changed. that every single plot of every single episode was based on a real story. Mm -hmm. They had insiders in the civil service and and MPs and stuff giving them giving them stories. So every one of those stories was was based on a real thing. I mean, details would be changed, but it was all so it was real. Like, uh, the the same thing but backwards with the the thick of it where the the creator of the thicket said yeah obviously we were, we were doing research and we were engaging we were asking questions but we would write what we thought was an outrageous plot and the next day somebody from one of the parties would contact me to say who told you about that how did you know yeah he's like oh for fuck's sake so he goes so we had to just keep escalating but mm -hmm. it was like that's why it holds up now because that is what was fucking happening. Yeah, so <laughs> it was the only thing that was unrealistic was that in the thick of it, there were people behind the scenes who had a plan and who knew what they were doing and had a a, a longer range plan for how we're going to get from here to here. He was like, "That has transpired to not be true. That's not true, and that has the account of many people who have come and gone in the annals of power in this country. Like, there's no freak addicts. It's day." Today, yeah, they are trying to survive one day, get through that day, and get on. To I the think next that's day. that's a huge problem with social media has caused a lot of that. I think that that's almost tying back to what I said about Joe Biden in the when he was engaging with these journalists. What he was saying, Roosevelt was in a wheelchair, and no one knew. <laughs> no one knew. But, Do you know what I mean? But Biden was, you know, he was making sense in what he was saying, but he was doing it very slowly, yeah, and very waffly. 
So what that would require is the journalist to actually pay attention to what you say for 10 solid minutes, take notes, and then translate that into an article. And that's just not the world we're in now. You know, you have to be able to condense the happening into a very quick fire fucking TikTok or some it's, shit like this. Listen, and I not, think that that's where that maybe has it, moved. It doesn't, it's not even that recent. So mm. in the uh, in the 60, 62 election, you've got Kennedy up against Nixon. Nixon. Yeah. And the the presidential debate... There was a huge divide between people who had listened to it on the radio. This is the sweating TV. thing, this isn't it? Sweating thing. This is the sweating people thing. People who had listened to it thought Nixon had won, and people who watched it thought Kennedy had. Yeah. And it was because Nixon was not televisual, and Kennedy was. Yeah. But Nixon was a much better talker than Kennedy was. Mm-hmm. Nixon was a cleverer man than Kennedy was. I mean, Kennedy nearly fucking took us to a nuclear war because he was on steroids. Nobody talks about this, but it's fucking true. Yeah, I think the monsters hasn't really <laughs> new to the world because they were on an overdose of stuff. He was he had Addison's disease and he was on steroids, so they were really, really coarse in terms of the um at, like the delicacy of the dosage back then. And I think that the reason the whole fucking Bay of Pig shit happened was because Dixon was off his fucking head on the roids. I think though that, that, that's Did you spill my bike. <laughs> Like the the media thing is that's fair comment, but I guess we from we to more modern times, maybe twenty four hour news mm-hmm. as well. Where and they're all on Twitter doing shit, well, I think, liking they, tractor porn and whatever. Yes, yeah, so they're like they can't seem to decipher between. So I, I've mentioned this I'm sure before about to me. I didn't think that Partygate was the angle that everyone should have fed into. I think that the PPE scandal, which we're get we're getting to this now with the COVID thing, we're finally getting to the procurement the side thing of it. That annoyed me about Partygate was simply that everybody was banging on about, oh, well, you were telling us to do this and we were putting up with this and, and therefore uh, as opposed to the angle that should have been taken on party gate was simply that it was fucking ridiculous that they were doing this because the danger was real everybody seemed to take from it the idea that the government made us do these things and it wasn't necessary as opposed to the fact that it was necessary but they weren't abiding by it and that's why they all kept getting fucking good yeah but i think that it's like, rather than looking at longer planning to come back to what you're saying it's like they're so caught up in the sort of survival mechanism yes. that the media have created not necessarily the politicians the media have created this environment now it's where the, 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 the na- and knives are out yeah absolutely yeah ted turner yeah tail uh, dragging the dog that's yeah it's a, exactly so rather than clinging to what their job should be which is yeah. simply just gently improve the country just to be in politics now is like a survival situation because the media have turned it into that yes so this is yes. sort of tying into what we were because we can go into detail about this but what you have said about the the scandal we up against what the smp have been involved with potentially versus what the tories have been up to and how that that does not feel like that's realistically balanced against each other it's not to say that the smp haven't done stuff question mark can't talk about all this but we'll get there with it but the coverage of this feels incredibly skewed yes. into how that's happening and because the media is not reflecting reality and it's creating a sort of non-reality that the politicians are then participants within a non-reality trying to please the non-reality rather than all they should be doing is focusing on their constituents and getting re-elected based on that. But to, again, come back to the whole thing about no one actually looks at who they're voting for now because the media have turned it all into football but teams. You get rid of that as well. But people haven't... For, so th- there's this complete lack of comprehension of the sort of general civics of the mechanics of the civics of the country that a lot of people have 20 years ago i didn't have either you know i had to go and fucking look it all up on wikipedia and learn it and um people think that the general election is a presidential race and they think of it in those terms it's to- tony blair's to blame for that that was the 97 campaign is the switch extent. point i believe yeah moved. to to a certain extent i mean the media also could just declare for that. That's again not the politicians. That I, was, I said believing Tony Blair. The media led that. That is yeah. that we did not used to do these kind of presidential style TV debates. That's a quite modern invention. The way the, the way this works. I'd get rid of those as well. Because to be yeah. honest with you, they're they're utterly pointless. I mean, I just the theatre debate the is theatre. This is understood. Because the idea what's is changing the, the prime minister or the head of the party is the represent representative of the group. So the idea is that you you're made to go to your local area. And you're meant to go and know hustings. who your local hustings, know who these local people are that are yeah. going to do stuff for you locally and all these other things. 
and then you vote for them and then they represent whatever that party is. But you should really be focusing on the individual, not the big bit. And theoretically, if we all focused on putting in capable, intelligent individuals, theoretically, all all ships rise, so to speak. Capable, the intelligent, idea. they exist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they're not made up people. Yeah. yeah um, but I, that, I think that's what's not been happening. and Because the media have turned it all into football teams still with a presidential slant. Yeah. So it's yeah. almost like the media don't, it, this is what I think what you're saying, it's almost like they don't know the mechanisms of how all this is supposed to actually well, work. I am. They don't. But it's not what media do and don't know. The they shape the narrative, so we get what Murdoch what's the wants. Goal? So what? That's what I'm not. I, I can't get, understand what is what is the goal apart. If all, are they just the mistake interested? you're making? Yeah. is in assuming that there is a goal. Yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah. That's it. So there's there, no, there isn't. No one's tending the light at the end of this tunnel. You, yeah, you see. So look at a journalist like Andrew Neil, right? Andrew Neil can be a very, very good hard questioner of politicians. There's no two ways about that. Mm-hmm. Like running up against the Brillo pad can be a very, very scathing experience. Um, he's an awful person himself, and he appears actually to be thick as fuck. But when well briefed by intelligent people that worked beneath him, he could do a good job of holding politicians to account because he's quite fearless. Mm-hmm. And fearlessness is a, is a trait of psychopathy, right? So it can be useful. Um, little bits of psychopathy can be useful as long as they're tempered by other things and as long as those people are prepared. Another good example of this is um, John Sweeney, the journalist who, uh, uh, he fucking went and dressed himself up and va- managed to get himself into a fucking museum where Putin was there for a visit and went right up to fucking Putin's face and asked him a difficult question. He could have got himself fucking murdered. That's a wee bit of psychopathy. Absolute fearlessness. Now, in the right hands, that's a great trait, but it does need tempered by other things. To be able to be a journalist of that, to do that sort of thing, you've got to be a bit odd Mm -hmm. if you think about it. In much the same way, you've got to be a bit odd to be a politician to want to put up with what goes along with being a politician or what goes along with being a very famous actor. You're paid a lot for doing those things, not because of what you do, but because of what you put up with because of what you do. I think it was Julia Roberts that said, I'm not paid £50 million for a film because of what I do. I'm paid that much because of what I have to put up with because of what I do. Um, Those people are are interesting, but they're not necessarily normal. But we, we make the mistake of assuming that because they have that fearlessness perhaps or and they have that confidence that they therefore have a depth of knowledge but they don't necessarily yeah i, mean, I think that's it, isn't it it's more now they're just driven by the sort of thrill of the gotcha moment that's what they're pursuing but they're they're not doing it to any real greater good so well, the fucking the eyes the ipad debacle we, which went on for like 10 fucking months which we've mentioned on almost every episode now that was such an own goal by i'm just gonna say right that was we such a fucking own goal by us because it and and that's where you get that kind of it's a problem of ego. The cover up is always worse usually yes. than than the crime. Just fucking admit what you did. Yeah. And it's one week's headlines. But the the point being that the the coverage of that went on and on and on and on and on. And it's you're right, everything you just said there, that was entirely he should just have been to let go basically for what he did uh, by trying to cover it up. Not well for covering it up, yeah, but it never needed to come to that because if he yeah. just come out straight away and go, Christ, this is hassle. So if, if, if I'm, if I'm, what are the ways like? Yeah, if I'm the SMP, we do like, you're, you're, but goodbye. That's the end of that based on that moral choice that you've made. Yeah. But the point being that the media that came the, that, up the doorstep more than once. By yeah, the way that uh, people were um, that cost us because people mm-hmm. who wanted to like Swinney were like. What were you doing? Man? Yeah, yeah. Free, free said the same thing on the election episode. He was like, "Yeah, that's that's how that's being." I just honestly weak weakness. Yeah, bad optics. Uh, bad optics. But I think the thing is that the the story itself was it dragged out, and I think that the coverage of other elements to do with just politics in general, like because by choosing to cover that, you're not covering something else. So therefore, it's now yeah. maybe rather than focusing on some of the good work so this is almost tied back into we're talking about biden uh on the american side of this where it actually reads to me that biden's done quite a lot of good work that i don't know an absolute fuck all about because the media aren't interested in that 
So what the, the narrative now is basically, which is right that he is, there's a cognitive decline, there's an issue there, yes. But that, the impression you would get is this man is a completely useless fuddy-duddy that's struggling to stay awake. The media have actually started to echo a lot of what Trump's been saying about it mm-hmm. because what they haven't done is cover the good bits. So what I'm just saying about the, the way that the, the journalists and the media have created this very toxic environment where politicians, I think, at sometimes are actually under unreasonable levels of attack and scrutiny, which is actually stopping them being able to do their job or at least focus on that properly. I would agree. You know, and it's created, it's created an eggshells, walking on eggshells environment yep. that I don't think is conducive towards good leadership. Well, now, yes, they do need to be held to account. I'm not saying let them away with everything, but I think that the media, the Twitter social media culture around this is actually very bad. And I think that a lot of British media need to really look at themselves, how they've been behaving to move this forward.